Good morning. It is August 5th, 2022, and we've just gotten through the uh, OTF OSU field day and the Olka field day. Um, uh, thank you to everybody who came out, both attendees and vendors. Very much appreciated. Uh, big increase in numbers on the OTF field day this year, and, and we're very glad to have uh, uh, such good uh, attendance. Um, online today, we've got Dr. Dave Shetler, Dr. Dave Garner, and, and uh, the infamous Todd Hicks. Uh, Dave Shetler is actually managing some technical glitches, and so he's calling in from the phone, but he's on the screen. It's amazing. Dr. <laughs> Shetler, give us an update on pestilence from the insect world. Okay, well, it's, as you mentioned, we'd ha we had uh, uh, both our field day and then the, the lawn care seminar the, the following day, and I must have had at least 40 people ask me, what's happening with the army worms? Yes. Um, and <laughs> the the reality is they are an O-show. Uh, it is now official. They are an O-show. Uh, not getting much reports from the southern states about uh, fall army worm other than just a, our, our normal annual uh, here and there. There might be a little outbreak of them. Uh, the folks that are in the field crops that are running the pheromone traps uh, are saying they're just not getting them. I, I think... Uh, one trap about three weeks ago uh, had, uh, or one group of traps had three, uh, and last week I got a report that they had gotten five. And and last year at this time, they were getting the traps covered uh, with them. So they're a no-show. This would be the normal time that they would fly north uh, and, and be here. Then I had other people say, well, what are these striped caterpillars that we find in our turf? And I, I had to chuckle and say, well, why are you looking? Uh, and they well, last year it caused all this problem, and and so uh, that's the other thing. Everybody's being hyper vigilant because of last year, uh, and they're rooting around. They're doing detergent flushes, and they're coming up with some common army worms. Uh, and my feeling is, I've always found common army worms at this time of the year in turf grass when we go out and do our chinch bug studies and and uh, uh, flood. We always get a, a few army common army worms coming up. And when I use a detergent flush uh, for our sod webworm studies, we always get a couple of uh, fall army worms coming, or we get a couple of common army worms and maybe one or two fall army worms, but we don't get that outbreak uh, that we saw last year. So I think everybody's good. We're okay with that. Next question is, what are the grubs going to be like? And <laughs> my answer is, depends on where you're at. Uh, if you're in an area that the turf went dormant, in that late June, early July window, and even though it's recovered now, that was the prime time that most of the Japanese beetle and mass chafers were laying their eggs. But again, their populations are quite low. Uh, the example that I give is I run a light trap at, at my home. Three years ago, at the, the first week of, of July, I was getting between 150 to 200 mass chafers per night. Uh, this year, I think I've gotten a total of about six mass chafers total. So, again, the population has crashed. However, uh, one of our extension colleagues over in, in uh, uh, the western part of the state, the uh, Lima area, has indicated that they've never seen so many Japanese beetles in their lives over there. So again, I think it just really depends on where you're at. You kind of have to keep your mind and, and eyes open. I think most of Ohio is going to be at fairly low risk uh, for white grub populations, but some areas uh, like over in the, the uh, uh, western part of the state uh, where they are seeing a lot of Japanese beetles, if you have turf that was irrigated and kept green during that egg laying period, yeah, you're probably at risk of having white grubs. So that's the bug doc update for this week. Uh, that's all I've got. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and appreciate your ability to get the technical uh, issues uh, worked out. Up next, Mr. Todd Hicks. Morning. Good day, everybody. Uh, disease wise. Looking at the weather pattern, it's going to hit Ohio with these pop-up storms off and on next four to five days. Lower 80s temperatures. This is perfect for Dollar Spot to rage. So um, I, I think if you haven't, uh, if you haven't have a spray out, 
or you're taking your foot off the gas, you're going to pay for it big time. There may be enough humidity to keep brown patch going, at least for in the short term. But if that temperature stays where they are, brown patch is going to fade away and not be a problem. So the biggest thing we're going to be looking at is dollar spot uh, raging away. If you've got a lot of play and a lot of stress on your area and you've dealt with anthracnose already this year, that may be another thing you need to look out for and take care of. But other than that, nothing really highlighted right now with the weather and uh, disease patterns. Thanks, Todd. Uh, any potential concerns with gray leaf spots or stuff like that right now? Not, not really. Um, I don't see a lot of humidity in the forecast um, and the high temperatures have gone away. Not, not many hurricanes down south blowing up these, these spores which uh, I'm not sure that's as a big a deal as it used to be, but um, I'm not hearing any threats yet or, or and I've not got anything in the, in the clinic to where I can um, um, look at it and verify that it is great least by yet. I like that, yet. yet. And, and of course, it's not just ryegrass, uh, tall fescue will be the other one that we want to keep an eye out for on that as well, right? It can be, uh, although it's not a, usually a killer on that. And um, we've seen it a couple instances in Ohio, but normally it is the ryegrass that suffers the worst. Now, you know, for the guys who are out in the field, diagnosing that, the difference between that and brown patch, what's the usual difference that we'd be looking for? You'd be sending a sample to me because every time I try to tell people how to diagnose it in the field, it doesn't look the same way it does in the books. If you've had it over and over again, it seems to mask itself and be something different. If you've got dead turf and you don't know what it is, throw a little bit in an envelope, send it to me, and uh, I can ID it really quickly. It is a very prolific sporulator, so all I need to do is look it under a scope, and I'll tell you what it is. I I've been on the fields too many time edge where I'd, I'd have bet the farm that I knew what it was, especially gray leaf spot, and I come back and look, and it's plain leaf spot. It's some kind of rise off. It's something else, so um, I tell folks, just be on the lookout if you got if you've got a susceptible grass and the weather pattern's right and you've not been on a program to prevent it, send me a sample ASAP so I can tell you yes or no and what what to spray or what not to spray. Sweet. Thank you, Todd. Dr. Gardner. All right. Good morning, everybody. So Crabgrass at this point is basically mature and it's attempting to produce seed. And we're about three to four weeks away from, you know, the days are starting to get shorter, the sun angle starting to get lower. Um, crabgrass all on its own will start to, you know, kind of turn that off color and, you know, even start to contract in size. But in the meantime, it's still something that's kind of an issue for us. Um, the good news is, is that at this growth stage, quinclorac all on its own tends to be pretty effective, you know, usually at least 70% control. Um, you can uh, increase the likelihood of getting complete control by combining quinclorac um, either with topramazone or mesotrione. A half a rate of each tends to do a pretty good job. Um, the main thing is, is remember that this is an annual, so um, keep it mowed so that uh, you're not letting it go to seed and, uh, you know, repopulate the seed bank for next year. Um, also, if you have severe crabgrass pressure, now is the time to be mapping out those areas so that you can consider the use of a pre-emergence herbicide on those areas next April. Now, at the OTF field day, one of the weeds that I mentioned that I'm starting to see more and more of is field pass palum. And sure enough, this week, uh, somebody sent me pictures of a grass that they suspected was field pass palum, and they were quite right it is. Um, the thing is about this particular grass, remember, is that the leaf blades are about twice the width or maybe three times the width of uh, crabgrass. And so for the same reason that we don't like crabgrass, field pass palum is yet more aesthetically displeasing. Now, the challenging thing, though, with field pass palum is that while we have a somewhat effective post-emergence control strategy, this is a tropical grass. But unlike crabgrass and other tropical grasses, this can persist in Ohio as a perennial. So it produces rhizomes. And so one of the questions that was asked when these pictures were sent to me was, um, what pre-emergence options can I use for next year? And the answer is none. 
it's already in the ground. If you've got it, the rhizomes are there, okay? Yeah, you can use a pre-emergence herbicide to prevent other seed from germinating, but where you have a patch of field pass palum now, um, you might have a patch of field pass palum next year. So tapramazone is the herbicide that will give you some control. It's actually really good control of the top growth. You go full label rate, um, you might need two applications three weeks apart, but you can get really good control of the leaf blades that are visible. The tricky thing and something that we don't quite have a handle on yet is how to get enough of the tapramazone into the rhizome so that the plant doesn't come back the next year. So here at the OTF Center, I absolutely have seen it happen where we sprayed tapramazone, tapramazone and we got 100% control. Um, and then the following April, there's these big, fat, sassy leaves poking out of the ground. You know, when crabgrass germinates, it's tiny little seedling leaves, right? In this case, it's, you know, like these much larger leaves because it's a, it's a mature plant um, and the, plant, uh, the leaves are coming from the rhizome. So if you see that, um, you know, you might consider maybe an additional application of tapramazone. Um, but again, um, where you've got it, we've got tapramazone that we can use to get rid of the, the, the leaf blades. Um, but then go and scout that area the following year and see if you might need to make a follow-up application. Again, sometimes I, I've seen it where the rhizomes aren't completely controlled. Now, some other weeds that we're seeing right now are yellow nuts. <laughs> Sorry, and... Dave, can I ask oh, you a question there to be completely rude? Sure. Uh, does that mean that if somebody has a uh, field pass bilum, that the only real option for cleaning it out is going to be a non-selective herbicide? Well, um, you can get selective control with the tapramazone um, in the fall. And then, like I said, I'm speculating that if you apply it again in the spring, you can continue to keep it beat down. But as far as permanence of control, I don't know that we know yet. We just know that we've got, you know, some selective activity um, with this, which, you know, Honestly, for a perennial grassy weed, there's not a lot of perennial grassy weeds that we even have selective control options for. So, you know, we're, we're, we're better off with this one than, you know, if it was like orchard grass or quack grass or something like that. But um, yeah, there's, there's a possibility if you wanted to actually get rid of it permanently that uh, glyphosate would be what you would have to do. Is, is this one that like we can blame the neighbors for or where did it come from? Uh, from the South. Um, it's, it's one of those, you know, like, um, for the same reason that I have a really nice crepe myrtle in my backyard, that's like 15 feet tall and blooming right now. Um, we've got a lot of weeds coming from, um, you know, that used to not grow in Ohio when now conditions are hospitable for their growth and development. So this is one of them. I'm about ready to talk about another one, which is false green Kalinga. And then, uh, um, yeah, there's, there's some others, but, um, carry on. I'll stop interrupting you then. It's all good. So, you know, yellow nuts sedge is another one that you might be uh, thinking about controlling. But at the field day, I mentioned that there's another sedge species that we're seeing now called false green Kalinga. And surely some of the people that came to the field day was like, yeah, whatever, gardener, drama queen. You, you know, it's like, um, yeah, you, you see it at the OTF center. That doesn't mean that anybody else is seeing it anywhere in Ohio. Sure enough, yesterday I got some pictures. All right. And they're like, what is this wiry stuff that's growing out of the green and the collar on this uh, uh, on this golf course? And it's like, well, if it's got um, um, a triangular shaped stem, um, it's probably false green Kalinga. And so they sent some pictures and sure enough, that's what they have. OK, now this is a particularly difficult situation because um, if you look, there is one of the sedge control products that is labeled for use on bent grass that is mowed at collar height you know, half inch or higher, but there are no selective control options on putting greens. And so if you see false green Kalinga pull, uh, coming out of your putting green, you should go out there and you should try to pick it um, before it gets bigger. This does produce rhizomes. It will form mats um, and it is a perennial. So it will keep, keep coming back year over year. Our patch of false green Kalinga here at the OTF Center is I think seven or eight years old now. And every year it gains, you know, five to 10 square feet or whatever. But, you know, this this is something that once you have it, um, it's not going away and there are no selective control options for. It. So, you know, again, if it's the greens, um, you know, send somebody out there to pull it out. Um, but remember that it's got a rhizome on it. So, you know, try to be thorough when you do that. Um, here are the sedge herbicides that we can use. Um, sedge hammer and dismiss are good options for yellow nut sedge. 
um, as is Solero um, or Vexus. Um, but again, if you've got the Kalinga and it's on half inch um, height bent grass or taller, um, Solero is really the only option that you have. And again, there are no selective controls for um, putting green um, bent grass. Um, the last thing that I was going to mention is that um, this is about the time of year that we should be preparing to think about seeding, right? Because the ideal time to establish grass from seed is anywhere from August 15th to September 30th. And so depending on when it is that you're going to do that, you should probably be going out with your non-selective herbicides. Again, if you're renovating, it's usually because you have a problem with this or quack grass or Bermuda grass, right? Or nimble will, you know, so one of those grassy weed species for which we don't have selective control options. Um, if that's the case and you're gonna do some renovating, this is the time to be putting out the non-selective controls so that you can be ready to put out your seed at the optimum agronomic timing, which you know in this part of the country is anywhere, again, from about August 15th to about September 30th. Ed, that's what I've got for this week. Dave, for the non-selective herbicide, would you be in favor of two ops, one op? I would say the reason that I'm mentioning it this week is so that you have time to go out and determine whether or not one app was enough so that you can put out a second app before it's time to go out with the seeding. And, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the label, it usually has a recommended um, a, a timing after application before um, you're supposed to put the seed out. And, um, you know, let, let, let's face it, usually you're going to be using glyphosate for this purpose because it continues to be the only non-selective systemic herbicide option that we really have. Um, and the unique, one of the unique chemical properties of that is that um, after it's applied, um, it's usually bound to the organic matter in such a way that it then becomes not available for subsequent biological activity. So you do hear stories of people saying things like I sprayed Roundup and then the next day, or glyphosate, I sprayed that and then the next day I, I seeded and the seed came up just fine. But if you look at the label, it doesn't say that you can seed the day after. The reason that they have that on the label, the way that they do that you're supposed to wait a period of time is just in case you accidentally spray more than what you're supposed to. Um, so there's only so many binding sites on the soil. And if you, you know, oversaturate it, if you want to put it that way, then you're going to have free glyphosate, um, you know, in the soil water solution that absolutely will um, control the seeding the, that, that, that you're attempting to do as well. So that's, that's why there's that time period in there to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, it's, it's adequately dissipated. But um, again, you, you should be able to get in one or even two applications um, and then be ready to go um, around the 1st of September with your seeding operation. That's interesting. I had somebody, a homeowner last week, asked me about whether or not glyphosate hung around for a year. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's a particularly difficult situation. Yeah, glyphosate's supposed to go away for homeowners in 2023. Um, because well, they had read that somebody, somebody told them if they applied glyphosate that it would last in the soil for a year. Probably not. If it's a sandy <laughs> soil in a really cold part of the world, I could perhaps see that. But I, I, the, Antarctica or the Arctic, right? Yes. There, there. There, there's all kinds of neat things that we see on the internet. Remember, you know, like I dabble in organic herbicides and uh, there was one time in the internet, it said that Fiesta herbicide was just as nasty as the synthetic herbicides because it contains the same active ingredient, um, um, acetic acid as the uh, um, synthetic herbicides. And it's like, okay, 2,4-dichlorophenoxy acetic acid. There's acetic acid in the molecule for the chelating agent of the, of the uh, um, iron herbicide, but it's like, that's vinegar. But they put that on the internet and there were people that read it and they were like, oh, that must be true. So yeah, I don't know. You gotta be careful with what you read, right? In just place that internet. Okay, if anyone does have any further questions on uh, seeding and the whole process of renovation, uh, Dr. Zane Rodbush, who's now at Davy Tree, uh, did a series of videos about two or three years ago, which is on our uh, website, and I would strongly recommend taking a look at him. He goes through the process of, uh, you know, that initial kill, and then the process of best seeding practices, irrigation practices, fertility practices, uh, all the way through to that first mow. And uh, it's a, it's an excellent series of, of like I said, five videos. Um, and that will be on our YouTube channel again. Yeah, they're quite well done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. Absolutely. Yeah.
marvelous. Uh, all right, we will leave it at that. Thank you again for the attendance, and we will talk to you all next week. Talk to you soon.